Good morning, everybody. How are you? We are ready to attack the PPP deductibility this morning. It's May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Um, I've seen a lot of funny um, attributes with respect to Cinco de Mayo happening on Taco Tuesday, but stopped by a virus named after Mexican beer. So um, hopefully the year improves and we're getting through this uh, quicker than we than we hope. I read something promising uh, just yesterday and shared it with Marina and our team that said uh, they do expect Florida to recover a little bit more quickly um, in the next three to six months as opposed to the to the rest of the country just due to the fact that um, we haven't been as hit by the housing decline as other places. So we hope that that trend continues and that we continue to enjoy um, a quicker recovery because I know that everybody is excited this week with the reopening of some of the businesses and and hopefully that will get us going in the right direction. As always, I'm joined today by Marina Parkin, the dutiful um, resident CPA tax extraordinaire <laughs> and my partner in um, trying to decide what the SBA is talking about when they issue um, these FAQs that are now being dropped essentially uh, on a daily basis. So we'll do our best to uh, walk you through what we know now uh, before we disappoint anybody, let me say that we're still going to answer a lot of things with we're waiting on guidance, um, but we do have some new guidance from the last time that we talked, so we'll jump right into it. Uh, today we're going to give you a little bit about our perspective, what's been going on, what we're hearing, what we're seeing on the street from our clients, from our banking resources, uh, from other professionals that we're chatting with. We're gonna talk about deductibility. We really found that over the last week, a big majority of our clients actually got their PPP funds in hand. So now um, the frenzy, the line has shifted from everybody running to the how do I get money line to now how do I get debt forgiveness line. So um, now the people in line need the money, it's, it, the line is dwindling, so that should be good. Um, at, over the weekend, the SBA did release and say that about half of the money that was allocated in the second round of the PPP has been allocated. So 175 billion has been awarded and I think that left 135 billion left. Um, so we're gonna talk then about the loan forgiveness debt, the deferrals and, and payoff FAQs. So give a little bit about our perspective. Marina, do you wanna, you wanna take the lead on that? Well, or? what I wanted to continue your thought a little bit on, on the available funds is, um, you know, SBA gave people uh, uh, last week when they issued these uh, frequently asked questions, um, they gave people an opportunity until May 7th to return the funds if they thought that their loan was obtained, I guess, incorrectly. If they uh, certified that, you know, the loan was necessary and they had economic uncertainty and then later businesses were questioning and you hear a lot of that still in the news about the big corporations getting the funds and, you know, they may not have gotten it, um, you know, with the right idea in mind. So a lot of them are giving money back. So I think when it comes to available funds, because SBA gave May 7th as the deadline, that safe harbor deadline for a lot of companies to give money back whether it's big loans or small loans, I think we may still see some more funds available for those folks that really need it. So um, that deadline is coming up here uh, in a couple of days. So I would imagine that there's going to be some businesses giving money back um, uh, using the safe harbor opportunity. So uh, if you still haven't applied and you feel like you need the loan and you certainly feel like you've got economic uncertainty and you're suffering, uh, please keep applying. The banks are taking applications. Mm -hmm. I hear uh, small banks are working fabulously in turning these applications around quickly. The money is in your hands within days of applying. Um, I hear, you know, on our end, I hear some clients with Sable Palm, mm -hmm. um, some other ones, Achieve is still going good. I think PayPal is still doing the loans. Um, Iberia uh, Bank is working. There's some other local banks um, that are definitely turning it around. And I'm just amazed at the speed at which they're turning these loans around. They're underwriting them in-house, they're reading the applications, it's not going in the box. So I really feel hopeful in, for those businesses that truly need these loans, please keep applying, don't think that it's too late, and, and um, you know, please keep going with the process. And the ones that have been in queue, I think that, um, you know, just 
keep applying because um, you should be able to get the funds. A lot of people were in queue from the first round and now with the second influx of funds, uh, they're getting their funds. Um, I just saw um, somebody mention, thank you, um, is that you know the funds came within four days of applying through local credit union. So that's, that's amazing. So that's on the good news. <laughs> Go ahead, Joanne. <laughs> well, I just wanted to jump in there because um, what I will say is if you are still stuck in line, um, we've gone back and forth, I feel like, with our, <laughs> with our answers to people. Like, I'm in line, should I move? And at first we said yes, and then we said no, and then we said yes. Um, well, actually, last week what we said was it depends where you're at in the process. So, for example, Chase and Bank of America had a pretty good gauge on where you were in the process. So they had like a four step at Chase particularly, they had a four step process that said, step one is we have your stuff. If you're at step one, yes, go somewhere else. If you're at step three, which is you're being submitted to SBA, do not go somewhere else. If you were at a bank where you don't have any idea where you're at and you can't get a person to advise you where you're at in the process and you don't have any indication that you've been submitted to the SBA, then I absolutely would um, run, don't walk, run um, to Sable Palm. I will say Kathy Collins there, we've worked with her for years. She's mm -hmm. been fantastic. Um, I didn't realize that they were doing loans for people that they didn't have accounts for mm -hmm. in the beginning. So I hadn't recommended them and they are, and we've had several clients use them and literally have money in a couple of days. Days from when they first reach out to Sable Palm. So they have done a really great job. And the thing I would like to give them kudos about is in our discussions with them, uh, one of the things that they said they took as a, as a philosophy of their bank was they're a community bank and these businesses are members of our community. So they felt very strongly that it was not, not their position that they would say, you weren't our customer so we can't help you. They felt like you're a community member and we have an obligation to help you. And I, I feel like that's, that's gonna go miles for them. That's a really, it's a great approach to see. And you know, I'm not knocking any of the banks that weren't able to take that approach, but um, this is, we are a small community in Sarasota and it is nice to see everybody kind of band together. We've talked a lot about that, you know, just with what people have done with with supporting local businesses and restaurants and, and trying to do your part, helping healthcare heroes and just everything. It's, it's nice to see the banks jump into that as well, because that's not, um, that's not always been the case. So, um, yeah. And I think that's not even how this whole process started at the beginning. Most banks did have the rule that you have to be a client of theirs. And so, um, I think a lot of banks have adjusted to say, we yeah. will still help you even if you were not a client to begin with. So I think all of that shifted as well as um, time went on and some of these big banks were not turning things around really mm -hmm. quick. Um, a lot of good questions too on, on you know, if I have applied with multiple banks, and this is probably a good time to touch on it. Um, and I got I guess emails to say, okay, you have been approved, but I don't see a PPP loan number. Does that mean I am approved or am I not approved? Um, I guess to me, I am not sure. I've had clients in all different situations. <laughs> Until you get the money, mm -hmm. I would probably say you are, uh, <laughs> you know, you're not, you don't know for sure. So um, if you've got for, uh, approvals from a couple of different banks, then I would still say, if you don't have a, a concrete SBA loan number, I would wait for the funds to, to drop before you really mm -hmm. understand that you got it. And um, I guess to touch on that further, um, a reading from um, one of the banks that sent an email with you know just some of their informational stuff yesterday, they mentioned that if you got money from more than one bank, just give one of the loans back. So, just if you if you got both deposits, which it's really okay that you that really exactly. should be stopped. But if there was a random if there if you randomly fell through the cracks where you got approved at one bank and then you got approved at the other and you did get both sets of funds, please give one back. But you're not going to get penalized or anything like that because you got both. So 
I think that if you're in doubt on whether you did get the loan approved because you don't have the number, wait a little bit more, you may still get the number. But if you end up in a situation with both of those deposits, you can give that one back, one of them back at one point, and then you're going to be okay with just the one loan, which is the only thing you're really entitled to. So is that your opinion as well, Joanne? It is, but let me piggyback on that as well and say, don't be too hung up though. If you didn't get an E-TRAN number, that's the transaction number that the SBA has given the lenders. Not every bank shared that with folks. I did see Fifth Third and a handful of other banks that did send that number along as part of their, where are you in the, on the map process. Uh, however, not every bank did that. For example, Chase did not do that. They didn't give you any kind of E-TRAN number. They just money they sent an approval email if you've received any indication that your loan is approved not awaiting approval but has been approved um for my experience and the people that i've talked to most people have had that money within two or three days uh the statute says 10 days they have to give you the money within 10 days but most of the people that i've that i've talked to have received that deposit within two to three business days now um We'll get to the guidance in terms of the debt forgiveness um, when we get on a little bit more. So just be patient with us on that. Um, that's, that's where we're headed next. Is there anything else um, question-wise, um, Marina, besides debt forgiveness and besides headcount payroll questions uh, that you feel like we need to touch on before we move forward? No, I, let's move on and I think as we get uh, talking more, there may be a couple of um, things no to, you know, to, to discuss. Let me also say that if you do have a question, please dump it in the Q&A box there at the bottom of your screen, and we will address absolutely as many of those as we can. Um, let's pop over and start with the loan forgiveness. One thing that has been really lacking in terms of the SBA guidance is actual information about how we go about getting the loan forgiveness. It's been made very clear. There will be a separate application. This is not an automatic, the loan disappears kind of part of the process. You will have almost an equivalent of the application that you had to apply for the uh, PPP funds. You will have an application to apply for the forgiveness of debt. Again, let me reiterate what we talked about last week. The bank has been absolved of liability in determining whether you are eligible for debt forgiveness. They are not charged with the task by SBA of doing a thorough underwriting and review. They have to reasonably believe that the documentation you submit is accurate. That means they can't say, oh, that's clearly wrong. We, they can't see conflicting information and just ignore it, but they don't have to, you could, provide your payroll reports and provide a copy of your lease and a canceled check. And if your lease amount includes uncovered funds that were not permitted uses of the funds, they're not going to say, ooh, you better back that out. So please don't have any reliance upon your banker and please understand that the SBA's position is you, the borrower, are responsible for those certifications. You are telling the bank, yes, these are approved uses of the funds and I therefore am eligible for the debt forgiveness. What's contrary is the bank is probably the better person to make the decision, but the SBA took that out of their hands um, mostly to encourage them to continue to move quickly. So this is really at the foot of, of the borrowers and the folks that are making these certifications. If you have questions, you need to work with your financial advisors, your CPA, your lawyer, your investment advisor, whoever you're working with on this um, needs to be able to guide you. And if you aren't sure, keep asking until you find someone who can help you because it is not going to be the banker. And even if you have an email from the banker that says, here's what you should do, I, I would be reluctant if that is conflicting with other information that you have. I, I hate to say I would believe the bank the least, but I, I don't mean that like they would be misleading you. I just mean that to say that's not any kind of shield of protection if that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these bankers are, everybody I've talked to, these guys are burning the midnight oil. They are 
there is nothing shady going on. Nobody's trying to take advantage of anybody. Don't take it like that. But it is very much um, in in the hands of the borrower. And that's been made very clear with respect to penalties and uh, misappropriation of, of that debt forgiveness. So that's gonna fall, um, that's gonna fall in your lap. Now, when it comes to the debt forgiveness, the rules have continued to change. We received a big bank of rules when we first got the PPP information, when the loan, when the package was first passed. The problem is, as Marina's favorite line, the devil's in the details. Um, so there are a lot of anomalies. There's a lot of things that don't apply. And we can't tell you absolutely 100% this is the documentation. Just like the, the PPP application, the SBA proffered a form template of the PPP application when the program began. The banks all took that to say, here's the kind of stuff we're going to need to know. Uh, but they all put their own spin on it. So there is no lock down, here's what you need to do for debt forgiveness. I've talked to a lot of people in the last week and my answer has been consistent. Be consistent, do only things that you should be doing in the ordinary course of your business operations. Now is not the time to get creative and don't panic. Um, so we've had a lot of folks who are saying, I don't know how I'm gonna use all the funds in the proper way and maybe I'll hire people, maybe I'll bonus people, maybe I'll, don't do anything crazy. Let's for right now, continue to stay in touch, continue, those, S, those FAQs from SBA are literally dropping daily now. I'm surprised the last batch of FAQs that dropped on the third did not address some of the concerns we're gonna raise today, but there's, there'll probably be more tonight. So be patient and be consistent. That's probably my two biggest pieces of advice. Absolutely, and in line with that, um, I was reading something yesterday that says if you, let's say, don't change your payroll frequency if you're normally running payroll at a certain frequency. So if you've got weekly or bi-weekly payroll, don't shift it, don't make it now, you know, going from bi-weekly to weekly or going from monthly to bi-weekly. Keep your regular payroll cycle going if you've got a normal payroll cycle. Don't shift it to go from Monday to Friday and so on because timing wise, it is going to work out. Now, as we get into this eight week um, period of what it is that you're doing, that, you know, there may be some changes and as, as you get through the operations, you will see. But at the moment, as you get these funds and you actually start utilizing them to pay your people, don't make any drastic changes. Exactly. And, and don't mess with ADP to say, oh, no, forget it. Run the payroll on Friday instead of Thursday. Mm -hmm. It's going to be more of a mess to try and clean it up later than it is for you to just, just to keep doing what you're normally doing. And we might see guidance on that. We've had a lot of people say, should, like you said, should I change my payroll date to line up with um, the date of the funds? That's actually something that's being discussed. We don't know if it's going to actually change, but the eight week time period, the testing period, uh, the, the AICPA has actually gone to the SBA and said, hey, that makes more sense if you line that up with people's payroll date rather than the date that the loan got dumped into the account. Um, so we don't know if that might change or not. Um, another big question that's come up is the time frame. The mm -hmm. eight-week period very clearly begins the day of the deposit in the account. That is not arguable. That is not negotiable. Right now, the rule today is your eight week um, time period begins on the date that you receive the funds. The question is gonna be, what do we do for folks who business is either not able to open, the stay at home order has not been lifted for their area or their industry, or as we've seen in our local Sarasota area, yesterday our restaurants were permitted to open but at 25% capacity. Mm -hmm. Many, many, many restaurateurs our clients and just people in the community have said, that's just not sustainable. How am I supposed to bring back all of these people and pay them full payroll if I can only do 25% of my typical capacity? That is something we do expect guidance to come on in the next couple of days, week tops. And I know people are getting frustrated. People are getting scared. I had an email yesterday from a client who said, I've had my money 10 days now. That's almost a fourth of my time, and I still don't know what I'm doing. I appreciate that. I promise that that is out there being discussed amongst the people that it matters, not 
I don't matter. I'm discussing it, but no one cares what I think um, in terms of SBA. Uh, but that's just something, like I said, we're just going to have to stay on the straight and narrow like you've been doing and do the best that we can. That time frame has not yet been discussed to be, ex has not been extended, but it's been discussed that it may be extended. Okay. Um, some folks are saying, you know, we, we don't have any guidance on, on how we're going to prove the use of those funds. Marina, what would you say is just going to be best practice until we get an answer from SBA to say, here's the, here's the three pieces of documentation you submit about each category? I think the documentation here is key. So just like you are preparing for um, to submit your t tax return documentation, or let's say you are under IRS audit, the same way you would prepare for that is the same way you should probably prepare for this. So I think that having the um, documentation of expenses, so your receipts, if you're paying the mortgage on your building and the mortgage interest is one of the things that uh, the loan can be used for and as part of the uh, forgiveness amount. So please have the either loan statement and that ties to the amount that you've paid. Same thing on utility bills. Again, utility bills are part of the allowed use of funds as well as uh, part of the forgiveness amount. So please have those utility bills. If something is on auto pay and it comes out, you will probably have a statement as well. So I think as much of documentation as you've got is key here. And um, as we get more guidance, believe me, the guidance is not gonna tell you, don't worry about it, don't document it. So if you have a good practice of documenting everything you're doing, you're gonna be in good shape. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. The regular um, flow of your expenses is gonna be the key here as well. If you've got monthly rent that comes out on the first and it's the same amount every month, and it's the rent that you know, you've know had since before February 15th, mm -hmm. you're gonna be fine there. Um, but it's if things are changing, if all of a sudden you paid rent twice, or all of a sudden you paid completely different amount of your mortgage interest, or you decided that to use this money and prepay your mortgage uh, you know, on your building for the next six months, that is all going to be different and if you don't have a statement to support that i think that that's going to be where the issues may run into so document 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 uh, the, if you can segregate where the funds are sitting to make it easier to look at the flow of funds that would probably be better a lot of businesses don't have more than one bank account I'm not sure if it's feasible to open a different bank account. We certainly recommend it. Just again, from tracking standpoint, um, it's a little bit difficult if you've got auto payroll, where the payroll automatically comes out of your regular operating account. So now if you're putting this PPP money in a different account, your payroll is not tying out of there. That's okay. What you may want to do is transfer the amount of payroll into the operating account and then show that um, EFTP is transfer of payroll out. Uh, and it's the same amount. So I think that's enough to document. You're gonna have your payroll reports for that time frame. You're gonna have your pay stubs. So all of these things I would most certainly document, document, and document. Another thing I've seen is the other concern is if you have folks who are over $100,000 in salary, even mm -hmm. if you did have one place where the payroll came from, even that payroll that runs, you're gonna have a component for that employee of part that is eligible for PPP and part that isn't. And it seems impractical to run two separate payrolls for that yes. staff member, mm -hmm. part for the 100,000 and part for the excess of the 100,000. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, the rent, that is another area where we've I've received a lot of questions if I would definitely encourage you to provide a copy of your lease agreement, that lease agreement needs to have been in place prior to February 15th. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had a few clients who have an unusual rent agreement. One was actually couched in the terms of a commission agreement because it was a venue. Um, so it was like a percentage of sales, if you will. Um, we don't have clarification on any kind of level for the detail of that. So I would say keep it all. Pay, again, normal business operation. Would you normally treat that as rent? Would you normally have put that expense on the rent line on your tax return? You know, those things are not conclusive. They're not an absolute answer, but they certainly point to uh, the right direction. At least you have an argument to say, well, I wasn't doing this in a way that is um, penalizable or finable. I didn't abuse the rules. I just 
had little guidance. And that's where I think it's going to be important that we don't have huge departures from our usual uh, operating behavior inside the company. Um, well, so and let me also add to the rent piece for mm -hmm. those that are self-employed and working out of the house. This is, those people are really getting kind of penalized for not really having uh, a legitimate a business rent. rent. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So what you've got here is you still have the ability to deduct your rent expense because you're allocating part of the home that's used as a home office. For tax return, you're still going to be able to take advantage of that deduction. However, for the PPP loan forgiveness part, this is not true rent because you don't have a rent agreement. Your business does not have a rent agreement with you to pay a certain rent to yourself for the use of this second bedroom. So mm -hmm. that I would say is not going to be part. As I venture to say now, and I haven't seen anything other than the people that are on Schedule C, that has been pretty clear that they're not gonna get their home office. But those that are, let's say S Corps, where they deduct part of the home office as, as you know, their office expense, I would venture to say now that you, that, that amount um, is not really considered true rent um, and that you, you probably didn't really even use it to get the PPP funds. You probably only went with payroll or whatever you pay yourself. So I don't think that really will be part of your expenses on the, on the back end either. So again, it's deductible, just not part of the amount that's going to get forgiven. Good questions here. Can you talk a little bit about, speaking of that, the taxability of the debt forgiveness and the subsequent um, lack of deductibility of the expenses. Yeah, we, um, I definitely want to, want to touch on that. Um, I do think you want to do that in a separate section. Uh, yeah, let's, okay. let's talk about deductibility in just a little bit. Okay. Uh, since we were on the forgiveness more, um, what I wanted to also touch on is the new, um, frequently asked question about the employee that you had to furlough layoff that if you're bringing them back, you have offered to bring them back, but they don't want to come back or cannot come back. What happens then? And the guidance that has been issued literally two days ago said that you will not be penalized for having that extra loan proceeds for the payroll that you're not gonna pay to the employee who you have made attempts to hire back but they cannot or will not come back. The key, so that is a big, big deal because that's the first we've heard about this. So again, it's very important. If you've laid people off or furloughed them and you got the PPP funds, you're bringing these people back. One of your employees does not wanna come back or cannot come back. Now you've got the extra proceeds. The, the guidance has always been very clear that you cannot lose headcount in order for you to get the full amount um, forgiven. So you cannot cut salaries by more than 25% and you cannot lose your headcount has to be the same. So now what they're saying is, if even if your headcount is down by one or two, but these are the people that you have offered to come back, but they cannot or don't want to, you are not gonna be penalized. As long as, again, everything is documentation. You need to make a written offer for them to come back and you have to have documentation that they have refused to come back or cannot come back, but it's gotta be documented um, so that the, your head count is low um, because of that reason, not because you just decided not to bring that person back. That is very important. And I think that came from a lot of businesses saying, you know, if somebody cannot come back, because let's say they're still home with the kids and the kids are have to be homeschooled and the person just cannot come back and they cannot do this job from home, um, Am I now just because of the Sloan going to be, you know, all of a sudden um, forced to hire someone just to have uh, a, a chair, you know, to warm body in a chair just to get the loan forgiveness, even though, you know, now is may not be the time to hire this right person or whatnot. So I think that came out to say, you know, this was a key person basically in your organization and you've tried to bring them back, but they cannot just as long as you don't have it, as long as you have it documented, you're not going to get penalized. So I think that is a very important question 
on the forgiveness that will come up. I know that's going to come up with several of our clients that are those small businesses where every staff person is key and you're not just going to run out to replace them just to get this loan forgiveness. There's going to be businesses that will end up in that situation for sure. I also heard from some of my clients that if their employees got, um, at employment, a lot of them are saying, well, you know, I'm going to be on unemployment and they may not want to come back. There's still a, a kind of a gray area, I think, here is that you're going to have to notify unemployment or there's going to be some sort of follow through to say you've made this offer and the person didn't come back. So I don't know yet how that, that relationship is going to work, but this is really going to be for those situations where the person probably does not come back for specific reasons of their particular situation. It's not going to be like, well, I just don't feel like it. Yeah, there was, um, Chris Bensonick was saying that there was different rules with different states mm -hmm. with respect to the reporting about that, but that here in Florida, there will be a certification sent to the employer that says, mm -hmm. did you offer these people an opportunity to come back, even if it's not full time, full pay to their full regular job. So mm -hmm. you might say, you know what, you can't, we don't have tables to serve, but you can come paint the walls and will pay X and it's 10 hours a week instead of 40, they can't turn that down or that will make them ineligible for, for unemployment. And a lot of people are like, I'm just not going to take that because I'll make more. Uh, it's the employer is making that certification under penalty of perjury. So that cannot be taken lightly. There can't be a side deal. Like, well, just don't tell them that I said you could come back. Mm -hmm. You need to be very careful. Even if you are trying to just help who's been a very good employee over time and say, well, I, you know, I know she's got a special circumstance and I want to take it. You, you've got to be very careful about that because those penalties are, are substantial fast. Um, we have to be not playing fast and loose with those. With well, those. and and we really don't know how long it's going to be, uh, how long it's going to take for people to look at it. Now we can say, oh, it's a big rush. There's millions of people affected. Who's going to look at my business or who's going to look at my employee? You have no idea how long it would take, what the procedures are going to be for testing it. Um, you know, they may audit pick or randomly pick some people to test for all of these rules and compliance with them. So I would say everything's got to be above board and everything's got to be documented. You've got to do the right thing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, one thing I want to say too, is that you need to be cognizant about usual and customary behavior, not doing something that you've never done before in terms of how you're paying people. It's, it's, admirable that people are trying to take care of their team and do things in a way that um, is going to help them. But we also need to be mindful that, at, like Marina said, this is going to be years to come, uh, that, that this is going to be discussed. And a lot of it's not even, the discussions that are going to come are not even people doing it necessarily wrong, but the lack of clarity and the ambiguity in the rules and the application of the rules. So even if you're doing it, right you believe you still may end up in a discussion about it so it's just something that we like i said can't take lightly um one question that's popped up here is is it appropriate for a lending institution to request online banking id and password i haven't seen any bank ask for that i've seen them request the um routing an account number on the idle applications because that was an automatic deposit and that application was made to sba even the banks that people made PPP applications to, I didn't see them ask which bank account you want. The general consensus was they put it in the oldest existing bank account of that business. And they know your bank account details because you bank there. Um, so I'm not certain, I, the question specifically was about the financing company called Cabbage. I'm not, they're a loan company. They are not mm -hmm. typically a depository institution. So maybe that's, that's legitimate, right. but I don't have any experience to say um, good, bad, or otherwise. But, you know, this is going to be ripe for uh, instances of, of fraud and people playing on, preying on unsuspecting people looking for help. So I would definitely uh, do some more digging around and, and just Google it and see, is this a scam? Because a lot of times that will answer the question as well. Um, back to the rent just a little bit, or I'm sorry, to the payroll a little bit, because this is another place where we've not really had a lot of clarity. Um, you talked a little bit, Marina, about what if my people don't come back? Um, one thing that we don't seem to have answers on yet is how the money will be affected, not just the headcount, 
on what if I bring my people back, but they, I only have 25 hours a week of work for them, not 40. That's really going to go to their 75% payroll calculation. Exactly. Even, can you talk about how that's an and, it's the money and the headcount, not just one or the other? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the payroll test on the forgiveness seems to be two-pronged test. Number one is that your headcount is the same. And um, we're, what they're looking at here is the full-time equivalent. So you are, if you are part-time or seasonal, uh, you're going to have to calculate the full-time equivalent people to, to determine if your full-time equivalent number was the same for when you applied to the levels of when you got the loan. Um, there is also additional guidance on, let's say, seasonal employees. So your full-time equivalent count, I think that the time period is a little bit wider because you your season may be off in that eight-week period. So you may be able to use a longer period to calculate the full-time equivalent if you're a seasonal employee or a seasonal employer. But uh, at the end of the day, you want to uh, make sure that the full-time equivalent count is going to be the same for when you applied the loan to to the um, when the loan period is again with the exception of those people that you uh, wanted to hire back and not coming back. So that's the one test is the headcount. Um, now keep in mind that the number of employees um, that was part time or seasonal or full time was you didn't have to do the full-time equivalent calculation to see if you were a small employer. And I think that's where some of the confusion is when people are reading. The, the part-time employee is considered one employee for you to, to determine, do you have under 500 employees to even qualify for this loan? There, you didn't have to do how many hours who worked. But for purposes of calculating your payroll and the forgiveness uh, piece of it, you want to really look at the full-time equivalents. That's how we understand it right now. So. Um, the second part of the test is the drop in the payroll level, which is uh, you cannot reduce their um, salary by more than 25%. And this is, I think, where the issue is if people are coming back, but they're not really working at the full capacity is, you know, potentially extending that eight-week period to coincide with when the business really is open. Uh, but Right now, as we know, you got to keep the same number of people and you cannot cut their salaries by more than 25% in order for that forgiveness to work. Yes. Now, can we talk a little bit about <laughs> the uh, completely unanswered land of what about payroll for the independent contractor, self-employed, realtor? How are yeah. they going to substantiate mm -hmm. payroll? Have you seen anything about that? Um, no, but I think based on the guidance that we got, when was I two weeks ago? Now the time frame is all a little messed up. But when we received the guidance, <laughs> today's Tuesday. <Jesus, no. laughs> right? Is it still Tuesday? It's um, Tuesday. You're doing the webinar. It's got to be Tuesday. <laughs> when we received guidance about two weeks ago on the sole proprietors, so those are the folks that are showing their business income and expenses on Schedule C of their regular tax return. For those sole proprietors, the basis of the loan was going to be the net income on your Schedule C, which was called owner compensation replacement. That is the number that also is gonna be used for forgiveness. So you don't necessarily need to move money from one account to the other. If you're a Schedule C guy, your, the basis of your application as the owner compensation replacement is still gonna be the same number uh, in the loan forgiveness. A lot of these businesses don't have a separate bank account. So you don't necessarily need to show that you move money from business to personal or you took money from personal and spent it on, on anything. Uh, the key here is that your owner um, compensation replacement that you applied with is gonna be the same number that you use for the loan forgiveness. Now, if you're a sole proprietor and you paid other employees, you're back to uh, still needing to show payroll reports and all the other stuff, but you yourself, for your part of, of I guess, compensation, 
it's going to be still that net income that was used based on 2019 number that's going to be part of the forgiveness. So I don't believe you really need to take any of that money out. We will get more guidance on that, but that's how we understood reading it from when they issued that about two weeks ago. Um, that's different though. If you are an S corp owner and shareholder, if you are on payroll and part of the payroll that you use for the formula to get the loan, if you are on payroll, continue to pay yourself payroll just like you did before. So you still need to, if you want that loan forgiven, you need to keep the payroll levels the same. You are one of the guys on payroll. Please keep paying yourself. If you cut your payroll, now you're failing the test of cutting the salary by more than 25% or not spending 75% of the loan on payroll. So if you, again, you will still have the payroll documentation to show payroll went out of the account, even though you personally are on payroll. So here you've got the uh, business owners, self-employed that are as Forbes that are on payroll. And then you've got the individual Schedule C um, sole proprietors that uh, don't necessarily need to take funds out. Okay. That's how we understand it at the moment. Again, I keep saying that, but that's true. We may come up with a, you know, more, more information or more guidance. As Once the applications are written too, and the SBA starts to drop more FAQs on this, you know, it's mm -hmm. tough to say, these are the expenses. This is what should be payroll for um, the kind of self-employed person who's not running a payroll. Um, but we expect more clarification about those expenses. You know, I can prove the payroll for our firm because we've got the payroll reports. Um, but if you're self-employed, you're certainly using those funds in the same way. Uh, but we just don't know how we're going to substantiate that. Another big question I'm getting frequently and today in the chat box and also uh, through my email over the last two weeks is folks who are concerned about they applied and used the wrong number for their loan amount because you know, back when this first opened up, there was a lot of lack of clarity on what was to be included as payroll to take the two and a half times. And so if somebody made a mistake, I didn't see really much opportunity to have those mistakes corrected. And now people are coming to me and saying, now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And that <laughs> is, again, it depends. Um, so I had some folks who included, um, employer portion of FICA taxes, for example. In, in their gross payroll amount, they didn't back some of that stuff out. The good news is those are small dollar amounts. They're clearly not something that you were doing to defraud the system. That's not something that gives me any concern from a penalty standpoint, um, but we're gonna need to see how this unfolds with the come clean by May 7th and return the money that you weren't entitled to. Um, can people fix that with increasing the payroll? Um, have you seen any guidance about that, Marina, to say, okay, well, what if I just, um, you know, give my manager a, a small raise to uh, compensate for those, for those funds? We haven't seen any guidance, but from everything I'm reading in the articles and people are, you know, there's a lot of stuff published by practitioners and common practices. I see that very common. If you got more by accident because the number you used in the application was wrong and it was never caught by the SBA or the bank in the recalculation or the backup documentation or something like that. If you got the, the bigger number, then yes, take advantage of that and pay your people a little bit more. And that may be your way to compensate them for sticking around and do, going above and beyond during this time. Uh, so definitely that's a good use of funds if that's the case. So that's one way to fix it is to actually do increased payroll for existing people. And maybe that's your opportunity to hire somebody now. Mm -hmm. And because there's no, uh, certainly there, you know, there's penalty for not keeping your headcount, but it's great if you actually hire an extra person and use that extra money that you have on payroll. So those are all the ways to kind of fix it, if you will, to still um, become part of the loan forgiveness calculation. But also keep in mind that if you got more money than you were entitled to, uh, there's a couple of different other ways to fix it. So for example, if you really don't need it, you can always give it back. Mm -hmm. If also you um, don't use it all, it's not going to get it forgiven that you have at zero, at, at 1% for two years, which is a fantastic loan to have. Mm -hmm. So let that be the loan that you have have as backup funds mm -hmm. um, to utilize as you re 
open and certainty for you continues, you may need that extra. The nice thing is the loan, if not forgiven, this loan, you've got six months of deferment of payments. So for six months from getting the loan, you don't have to pay anything, including the interest. And the interest that accrues on the loan that is gonna be paid back, it's only on the portion that is going to be paid back. So let's say you got 150,000 of PPP funds and maybe 25 of that was a little too much. So you get 125 forgiven on the 25,000 that becomes a loan. You're only paying interest on the 25,000, not on the whole 150 grand of the, of the amount. So now you've got 25,000 loan at 1% for two years, which for six months you don't have to pay. So I think that's a pretty good loan to have in these uncertain situations. And then if you feel like you don't need it, your business is up and running and please pay it back, pay it back sooner. You don't have to wait. So I think that's where, you know, people are worried about, oh my God, am I right in getting this forgiven? If you did get more money, it's not a bad loan to have if you don't even get it forgiven and you decide not to give it back. Um, I do want to jump a little bit into the uncertainty piece that we touched on last week um, that before we get into the whole deductibility of expenses, if that's okay, Joanne. Um, before you run there, can I just, I'm getting a lot of questions about the health insurance piece and I think we need to just yeah. circle back on that. Can we talk about health insurance yes. being included in the 75% if you're a realtor, if you're a small business owner, and what if you are a small business owner, but none you have group plan but none of your people participate can you talk about the difference um, so what if i'm a realtor and i or self-employed sole proprietor no yeah people. sole proprietor self-employed you're on schedule c for the tax return purposes mm -hmm. your health insurance are not part of the compensation that's very very clear mm -hmm. again deductible on the tax return not part of the ppp loan that is going to be forgiven so that's pretty clear. If you're an S Corp and you've got a group plan and you're paying health insurance under that plan, the payments on the health insurance are part of the compensation amount that's gonna get forgiven. So I think that's pretty clear as well. And you, the owner, if you as the owner are, uh, uh, are on that plan as well, then yes, your health insurance that are part of the group plan are part of the forgiven amount. Even if you're the only member of the group? As long as it's a group plan, right? As long as it's a group plan, absolutely correct. Okay, um, all right, perfect. I think I'll, I'll let you off the hook then on, uh, on that. We had several questions on that. I tried to type answers yeah. to everybody, but that way we yeah. are. Well, and that the same thing goes for the pension plan contributions if you're putting into the you know retirement plan, uh, which also may be another good use of funds. Maybe you normally, let's say you don't typically fund your, uh, your pension plan until later in the year or the beginning of the following year, but you've got some extra funds now. Yes, go ahead and fund the pension plan now. Um, you know, and, and I think that's allowed use of funds. Um, perfect. Before we move on, I want to I want to hit one more thing because uh, this is still being discussed. We talked a little bit about um, what if your business isn't open to the public mm -hmm. or not, at a, and your restrictions are so much that you can't bring your all your employees back. Um, we need to just reiterate that if you can bring people, back, either hire new people and use the, train them while you're closed. You can do maintenance to your property and you know, cleaning, put in, you know, install new hand sanitizing stations, whatever you need to do to prepare to open, uh, you can be paying folks for now. But if they aren't able to come back until the fall, for example, um, there's been a, an outcry by the accounting organizations to the SBA to say, hey, you know, like Marina said, if they need an eight week ramp up to get the business going, you're in hospitality, you do wedding receptions and you can't, there's no wedding receptions until the fall. It doesn't do anybody any good to have eight weeks of payroll in June when if I'm a florist, I can't do any flower arrangements for a wedding until the fall, say. Um, there's been no adjustment for that. There's been no extension. There's been no exception. Not even to say I can prove my industry is still on lockdown. There, you know, this is a nationwide um, rule that SBA has dropped, but the states are implementing the opening of different businesses in different industries with different restrictions at different times. So that is a problem. I can't imagine it won't get addressed 
I am a little bit surprised it hasn't been addressed yet, but you know, up until the end of last week, all of the questions the SBA was dropping, the FAQs and stuff, were really focused at how do we get, how do we do the applications? How do we get the money in people's hands? Mm -hmm. Now that's loosened up and all of that attention, all of the effort on behalf of the SBA is going to be geared towards this debt forgiveness and how do we evaluate it? So I'm a little surprised we don't have that yet. I'd be surprised mm -hmm. if we get to Friday and don't have it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so stay tuned for those, but they may end up saying it is what it is and end of conversation, but we need an answer one way or the other. So I, will I see a fantastic so question here that I want to talk out loud about, <laughs> which is the 100,000 salary. So here's the question. Maximum amount of salary is 100,000. If that's the case, is 25,000 too much to be forgiven, just used for salary in a scenario where the salary is 10,000 a month? Okay, fantastic question. Keep in mind, if your salary is 100,000 max, your monthly is 100,000 divided by 12. That's your monthly average, which is 83333. That times eight weeks only gives you available salary for those that are over 100,000 to be about 15 grand or so. So I think if you are 100,000, because they're using the average monthly salary here as the calculation. Um, you shouldn't, uh, you, you won't be able to get your um, average monthly salary in over that 83333 3, 3, 3 calculation for the forgiveness portion. So I think that, um, and again, if you're increasing your salary now because you're gonna cut it later, I still, we, we still don't know what's gonna happen there if the forgiveness period is gonna get extended or used in a different time frame. But the way that I understand the 100 salary, the 100,000 salary question is your average monthly is 833. If you times that by, you know, for eight weeks, uh, the 100 salary uh, person is gonna get forgiveness of only about 15, it's almost 16 grand or so. Okay. All right. Let me touch quickly on the, forgive, the, the deductibility of expenses here. That's been a fairly, fairly big issue. If we're ready to move into that, Joanne, is yep. that good? Yeah, that's um, fine. Now, we've been talking about so far the SBA guidance. A guidance from SBA, maybe some interpretation from the banks, stuff like that. Well, this particular thing came from IRS. This is a notice that's been issued a couple of days ago and it comes from IRS to tell us that if you have this loan that is going to be forgiven, the forgiveness is not going to be part of taxable income. Fantastic. On the flip side, the expenses that are gonna be used with those loan proceeds are not going to be deductible in return. So what IRS gives with one hand, IRS always takes back with, with the other. There's been, that's been sort of expected and kind of talked about because normally in the spirit of the tax code, that's exactly what happens. You should not double dip. So if you don't have a true cash outlay for the expense, you shouldn't have the ability to deduct the expense. So in a normal course of business, when you borrow money and you spend that money, to pay for expenses because you have to give that money back. So you actually have an economic outlay. On the flip side, you get the benefit of the expenses that you spent. The timing may be off. You may pay the loan back later, get the deduction. That's um, just the timing thing, but the actual ability to deduct those expenses is always around. So what they're saying here is you will not have an economic outlay by being forced to repay this loan. And we're not gonna make you pick that up as taxable income. But on the flip side, then you cannot deduct expenses that you're gonna use the loan proceeds for. That is a huge deal, huge deal. Because this particular rule is now being criticized to say, although that has been a normal practice, in the IRS world for these rules, we're not in normal times. And the intent of these loans was not to get your ability to deduct reduced. The intent of these loans was to give you an extra benefit of getting that cash inflow in the business that is necessary so you can continue to operate, not to 
cheat you out of these deductions on the back end. So because the intent was such, please see if you can possibly um, you know, make an exception for this particular deductibility. So this is what we're waiting on. So as we know right now, the, the expenses are not going to be deductible for the proceeds of the loan that are going to get forgiven. Now, if this loan is not going to get forgiven or a portion of it that's not going to get forgiven, you will be able to deduct the expenses to the extent of the portion of the loan that's not forgiven. But if you've got a 100,000 PPP loan and all that 100,000 is going to get forgiven, guess what? You're not going to be able to, under the current rules, deduct 100,000 of your payroll, rent, and utilities, which is a huge deal. So I think we're going to see a lot of businesses if this continues and if this doesn't really get fixed or we don't get any more um, change or exceptions to this, you're going to see a lot of folks next year doing tax returns that, are going to, that we're going to have to adjust the deductibility of those expenses. And let's say if they're a business, I, what I anticipate is the businesses that are going to be back up and running, maybe not necessarily to their normal level of revenue, but that will recover before the end of the year. Now they're going to get reduced dramatically reduced expenses and now they're going to be back to kind of being in the taxable situation next year so this is something that is fairly important to keep in mind we will be watching for any irs updates or anything like that but one of the things that it triggered is to say look um i know everybody's chasing these ppp loans and this is fantastic it seems like it's free money but as we're seeing now there's really no such thing there's no such thing as free money. You, number one, you really need to have to have the need for this money. So it's gotta be necessary. You've gotta have economic uncertainty and you won't be able to deduct the expenses that you paid uh, with this money. So now maybe instead of chasing these loans, we need to look at some of the other provisions that are available to us. For example, you get the loan, keep the loan, make it a loan. Don't necessarily chase the forgiveness of it. So you're not, you've got a loan that is, a good loan, um, or maybe you don't need the loan at all, but you've got the payroll tax credits that you can utilize, whether it's the employee retention credit or the extended family sick leave credit, if that applies in your situation. The other thing that's widely available that is not being talked about now because of the loan situation is, you know, the, the ability to defer payroll tax. You can defer payroll tax, um, the employer portion of the FICA payroll tax over the next two years. So the tax that's due now, you can break it in two and pay it over in 2021 and 2022. If you are not using a PPP forgivable funds for this payroll cost. So maybe you just need to defer your payroll tax, take employee retention credit, and take the deduction of your expenses if you're not able to get the loan or don't really want to chase the loan or afraid that you don't necessarily have the um the, the economic uncertainty um, thing that is, you know, applies to your particular business. So we gotta be really careful when we are looking at our client situation and advising them on what to do. And as you guys, you know, our clients and some of you who are listening that are not our clients, it is really important to look in your particular situation. Is this loan right for you in light of the current provisions as we know them? And uh, maybe we need to look at some of the other things to, to take advantage of, um, to give you a, a break on taxes or, and so on. Um, if you're, I would like to pop over at some point and talk about, um, necessity a little bit. Uh, that's mm -hmm. clear as mud. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you want to tie up on the, the deferrals. I think that's it on the deferrals. That's, mm -hmm. so there's been a lot of talk in the last week or so about this e economic uncertainty and that you, the funds are necessary for the business to survive. There is a big, wide expanse of definitions about necessity, none of which have come from the SBA, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. Um, we've looked at court cases, we've looked at IRS codes on necessity in other areas, and there's nothing uh, persuasive there that says this is what SBA is going to have to use, just ways to kind of look at, you know, does this mean, you know, necessary for you to survive a week, a month, a year? We don't have clarity on that. Um, Taylor asks, do you think the SBA will review, will request revenue loss documentation to prove necessity? That's something that we don't know. They've talked about that. They, um, 
have discussed showing a, a dip in in your revenues uh, from a time period of same time period of last year. So not necessarily looking at February's revenue, but more looking like now at May 2019 as compared to May 2020 revenue. That is not confirmed that they're going to do that, but that is something that has been discussed. So it wouldn't surprise me if that was um, if that if that became a thing. Um, lots of questions about unemployment and PPP. No, you cannot do unemployment and PPP at the same time. If you are already on unemployment and then you get your PPP funds, you have to turn off your unemployment during the eight week testing period for PPP. And then if you still um, are eligible for unemployment, you would turn it back on at the expiration of the eight weeks to take the, the PPP is replacement of payroll. So that's just like having a job. So we can't be in both areas in terms of PPP and, um, and unemployment. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a loan, it is forgivable. So um, even if you don't particularly have debt forgiveness, uh, everything that we've seen points to, you cannot be on both at the same time. 